time, and the Parmenides didn't trust the senses. And so a lot of these interpretations are coming from these kinds of guys, not necessarily from the poem itself. So Sextus Empiricus has an interesting interpretation of the poem, where he's saying, Parmenides riding this chariot with sun maidens and the goddess Dike, um, the, the sun maidens are, are the eyes. They represent the eyes, because sun, light. The, the mares, the horses, represent the irrational impulses, and Dike represents justice, which keeps the impulses under control. And then there comes a point towards the end of the proem where this anonymous goddess uh, appears and uh, is, is leading Parmenides on this chariot out of the hall of darkness, out of the hall of night, and into the light as the sun maidens unveil their eyes. And so this is a big metaphor for leaving your state of benightness and moving into a state of enlightenment. And this theme of light, night, uh, of light and daytime um, versus night and darkness is going to come back again. It's, he's going to use it as a metaphor for truth versus falsity. So light is going to be is going to symbolize truth for him, and darkness is going to symbolize falsity. It's also going to be light is going to symbolize something or existence. Falsity, or, and night is going to symbolize non-existence or nothingness. So you have to keep this keep the, this is the interpretation of sexus empiricus, but I think it actually does help explain what ends up happening in the doxa, which is probably one of the more confusing parts of the poem for scholars up to this day. So just keeping that in mind. So. Right before we get to the end of the proem, the uh, actually no, it might actually be right in the beginning of this. Uh, the goddess tells Parmenides, no, it's right at the end of the poem. The goddess tells Parmenides that she's going to talk to him about two different ways, two different paths. And the Greek word for uh, for path, well, first let me erase this. So yeah, she's going to talk about two different paths, and so she's talking about two different. Odoi and well actually Odoi, Odoi, and kind of like a soft H. And this means this is the plural for paths or paths or ways. And she's talking about two different Odoi, this is the plural. And what's interesting here is that this seems to be a metaphor for method, and actually the word the singular, Odos, is where we get the word methodos. And Aristotle actually uses these interchangeably in his physics and metaphysics. So it's not unprecedented. Well, Parmenides did come before Aristotle, but it's not unheard of that ancient Greek philosophers were using these interchangeably and using path as a metaphor for, for uh, method. So we have two different methods. There's something in Chinese philosophy that's very similar, the word Tao, like in Taoism. Is, uh, it also means path or road, and so they use this metaphor as well. So we have two different paths, and one path is the way of truth, and one path is the way of opinion. And the way of opinion is the path that he thinks that most of us are on, and he's trying to get us to go to the way of truth. So the goddess tells him certain things about the way of truth. One of, one of the things she gives is a psychological or phenomenological account, which is to say that she's saying the way of truth is persuasive, which is not to mean that truth is the only thing that persuades you, but it seems to suggest that if you do encounter the truth, it will persuade you. Of course, you could be persuaded by other things. That's part of the moral of the story is that many, we're on the wrong path, we're persuaded by it, and we would not realize that we're on the wrong path, so we can be persuaded by both. But truth will always be persuasive, whereas falsity or opinion, not always. Then she goes on and gives some axioms. For example, like this is kind of like a bad translation of the Greek, but um, not to not be is to be, which could be considered something like saying not nothing, not nothing is something, and so these are kind of like the, these are like the starting axioms. Hello. So yeah, Oops. not to not to not be is to be, or not nothing is something. 
And so what's going to end up happening is, okay, well, then what, when she goes on, she goes on later and says that uh, she makes a claim about knowledge. So she also has an epistemological claim, which is saying that knowledge must be affirmative. So you don't know something by only by understanding what it is not. You, you, you would not know what it is if you just say that it's not this, it's not that, it's not that, it's not that. So this works. So we might think that we can get out of this for saying, well, like, I don't know, um, a, a dog is like a four-legged animal with low, and you try to think, okay, so I can, I can define a dog without saying that it's not a cat and not a zebra, and so this isn't a problem, right? But then it still is a problem, because what about truth and falsity or something and nothing? How are you going to define something versus nothing without just saying that something is not nothing and nothing is not something? And so what he's saying is if that's how we understand nothing and something, or if that's how we understand falsity and truth, we don't actually know anything about nothing or something. We don't know anything about truth or falsity. So we can't really say that anything is true or false because all we know is that what it's not. And so we don't know what anything is. Well, that's a problem. You have, you have to do better than say that it's not. And um, this, is, this, actually, this is Plato's interpretation of Parmenides. And Plato wrote a dialogue called the Parmenides. It has two names. One name is the Parmenides. Another name that sometimes it's given is the, on the ideal forms, which is very interesting because um, in this dialogue, Plato uses Parmenides as a character who is arguing against Socrates. Hello. Plato is using Parmenides as a character who is arguing against Socrates, and this is the only dialogue Plato ever wrote where Socrates loses a debate. In the way that we usually see Socrates make others look foolish, this is where Socrates is the one made to look foolish by Parmenides. Yes? Question is, how often does, okay, so Plato's debating, so Parmenides is debating Socrates. In Plato's dialogue called the Parmenides. Okay, never mind. My question is not anymore. Oh, what was your question? <laughs> I'm wondering, uh, because I know Plato wrote the Socrates stuff, so I'm wondering if there's ever a debate where he cast himself against Socrates and then made him lose. Made Socrates lose? Yeah. Well, arguably, this is that dialogue. Arguably, yeah. Plato is speaking through Parmenides. Yeah. Because a lot of times people are thinking, oh, Socrates is really the mouthpiece for Plato. And so whenever P Socrates makes other people look bad or stupid, like they don't know anything, that's just Plato trying to speak through Socrates. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is how he advances his views. But then that, well, that theory starts to break down when we get to the Parmenides dialogue. Not just the Parmenides dialogue, but especially that one. Because uh, Socrates loses, uh, Parmenides wins, and Parmenides is behaving very much like we see Socrates in all the other dialogues. So it kind of suggests that this is really Plato all along. And Plato just this time decided not to be Socrates. This time he will be Parmenides. But why would he do that if he didn't, if he didn't have some special appreciation for Parmenides, in the way that we, we, we see it seems like he had a special appreciation for Socrates. He's treating Parmenides in, in that same way, in fact even better, because he uses Parmenides to humiliate Socrates. So there's, there, there is, there's something big there. Um, the thing is, is that in the Parmenides dialogue, Plato is not really advancing the ideas of Parmenides himself. He's, he's really improving the, ar the arguments of Zeno, who was a follower of Parmenides. There's another dialogue called the Sophist where Plato is, is advancing the philosophy of Parmenides, but then halfway through the Sophist, there comes a point where things get controversial, and then this becomes a matter of debate. But leading up to that, so the Sophist is another dialogue where we don't really have Socrates playing a big role. Uh, in this time, in Sophist, he doesn't lose, Sophist, he's just a spectator. He's just watching two people debate. He's watching Theotetus have a debate with an Eleatic stranger. So Eleatic again. Parmenides was from Elea. Zeno was from Elea. So this time again, Plato is speaking through an Eleatic to make a point. But in the Sophist, he's, he actually quotes lines from the par poem of Parmenides, verbatim. Uh, he quotes the first two lines of the seventh fragment. The poem is 19 fragments. He quotes the first two lines of the seven, seventh fragment verbatim. And then he quotes them again, almost verbatim, except for like one or two words he changes. And leading all the way up to the middle of the Sophist dialogue, Plato is making this argument that Parmenides, or he's giving this interpretation of Parmenides, saying, look, Parmenides is trying to say that 
there's no such thing as falsity. Because what is falsity? If, if you only understand it as being not true, then you don't really you don't know what it is. You only know what it's not. So you don't know anything about falsity if that's the most you understand about it. Same thing with truth. If you only understand that it's not falsity, you don't know anything about truth. And then, so then we back up and say, oh, well, okay, truth is what re reflects something, and falsity is what reflects nothing. And then, well, that creates a problem, too, because we have the same problem recycled now with something and nothing. How do you know what something is if all you know about it is that it's not nothing? N nothing cannot exist. So, and, and you, so there's no point in even trying to define nothing. You can say, oh, well, it's not something. You can't even really talk about nothing. But then you don't know what something is because you just know that it's not nothing. And that's not knowing what it is. And Plato has a huge problem with this. And he tries, he tries to come up with a, well, okay. Actually, I should get back to the poem for Parmenides because what ends up happening is in, in the poem of Parmenides, he starts talking about, he, com he compares the two paths, and he's saying, look, the, the path that mortals are on is a path where they believe that some, they believe in something and nothing. They believe in truth and falsity, and this is a mistake. You can't have the two. You can only have one if you can have any at all, but he seems to rest on that you can't have one. And what he ends up saying is that in order to say that something is false, you're, you end up saying that it's nothing, and then you end, which means that you're saying that it's not something. And so you don't know what it is, in which case you don't know even whether it's or not false. it's false. That's a problem. Like, what, do, what does false even mean? So this is a huge problem for Plato, but what ends up happening is once we get to the end of fragment 8 and we get into fragment 9, which is the beginning of the doxa, that's the third, the last part of Parmenides' poem, Parmenides comes up with a, a false cosmology where he starts, he, he starts saying, basically, in the beginning, we have night and darkness, and night and darkness mix, and out of them come all these other things, and out of them come all these other things. And you know, in between this, this light, there is this darkness and darkness, and we have darkness and light mixing and all that. And this is his way of trying to say that, look, remember in the beginning that uh, night represented nothing or falsity, and light represented something or truth. And he's trying to say, look, they, they start with something and nothing, and they're trying to say that they're both something. So you're saying that nothing is something in order to say that, oh, both of these things exist, right? So, so like existence and non-existence, they both exist. In which case, non-existence is part of existence. It's mixing with existence. It doesn't make sense. So he's trying, to, he's trying to show, oh, look, all of these different theories of reality, all these different cosmologies, they're all the same and they're all wrong in the same ways because they all, they all start with these two opposite forces that end up having to mix in ways that are just impossible or don't make sense. And when you, when you scrutinize them, it's clear that they don't make sense. And Plato goes with this interpretation. And at a certain point, halfway through the sophist, he's like, oh, no, 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 no. Well, speaking for the Eleatic stranger, he's like, no, 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 I got it. I know how to solve this problem. Something and nothing have differentness in common. But then there you get the same problem all over again. Differentness, is it something or nothing? If it's not something, well, then wouldn't it be nothing? And if it's not nothing, wouldn't it be something? If it is something, then you're saying that something and nothing have something in common. You just recycled the problem. Most people, most people for hundreds of years, more than thousands of years now, have assumed that, oh, this is actually a genuine solution to, that Plato presents to solve the problem. Yes? I don't understand the difference between the difference being something and nothing. What, what, what did you mean? Okay, so I'm using, I'm using the word something and nothing in the way that they would say being and non-being, right? Or is and is not. Um, so the way that they would say it is that um, what is and what is not have differentness in common. So we're saying they are different. Okay. Right? So um. we're not saying that one is not the other. So it, see, it gives the impression that we've solved this problem of saying, oh, I can say what this is and what this is. They're opposites. They are different. I never have to go into the weeds of saying, oh, this is not this, and, and that's all they are. So he's like, oh, they are different. They are. If they are, they are different. But the thing is, when he's saying, you know, is and is not, that's, that's, he means it in the sense of existence. So existence and non-existence have, are, are different, meaning that they exist as different beings, in which case the non-existence exists, and that's the problem. 
So some people think that, oh, this is Plato's brilliant solution to responding to the Eleatics. I don't think that's what happened at all. And this is where I'm, I'm, uh, I'm challenging the academic ex establishment. Because what, I, what I'm thinking that Plato was actually doing was mimicking the poem of Parmenides. So all the way up the first half of the Sophists, he's, he's mimicking the way of truth. And he's trying to show, like, look, this is what Parmenides is trying to teach us. He even quotes Parmenides verbatim in those parts. It's like, this is the way. And then at a certain point, it's like they make this weird little turn where it's like, oh, no, that just doesn't make sense. That can't be. How can we say that? Not much of an argument there. And then the Eleatic stranger who's speaking, presumably that's Plato speaking through him, he says, no, they have differentness in common. But this is where it starts to resemble the doxa, the third, the third part of the poem where he has this false cosmology of, oh, you have day and night and they come together, you know, they're different, but they both are, they both are. And the whole thing is like, in Parmenides, it's very obvious that this is a false cosmology. It's not meant to be, it's, it's a sham. In Plato, it's much less obvious, it's much more subtle, but it's there. And the pattern, the way that the Sophist and, and Parmenides' poem match up, suggests to me that he is mimicking, he is mimicking the poem. In fact, even in the, even in the dialogue the Sophist, he talks about how Sophists are mimickers. And he keeps going back to this idea of imitation and mimicry. So what ends up happening is, I should back up and talk a little bit more about the Sophist, because at the beginning of the Sophist, uh, we have Socrates, Theotetus, and the Eleatic Stranger talking, and they decide that they're going to define three things. What is a Sophist? What is a politician? And what is a philosopher? And Plato ends up writing dialogues. Uh, obviously, this is in the Sophist, so he wrote the Sophist. He also wrote a dialogue called the, the Statesman, that's about the politician. And, but the third dialogue that he said he was going to write, he never wrote, which is the philosopher. And part of the reason that uh, I think he never wrote it, there, there are clues in the sophist. Because uh, in the sophist, right before he comes up with this quote-unquote solution to the problem that Parmenides presents, uh, the Eleatic stranger speaking to Theotetus says that, look, if, if we don't accept that, that uh, some, that nothing can be something, then logic disappears. We can't, there is no logos. And then the Eleatic finger is like, oh yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Okay, well I guess that something and nothing have differentness in common. And it just does not seem like a serious move forward considering how nitpicky they were up until then. And all of a sudden it's just like, oh, hey, good point, you're right, okay. We'll move. It, like Something does not seem right there. It seems, it seems more likely that this is what we would call Socratic irony, except really Socratic irony is Plato's irony, because Plato is usually using Socrates as his mouthpiece. So at this, at this point, they're like, oh, okay, so if we don't have truth and falsity, or something and nothing, if we don't say that they both interact, then we don't have logic, we can't. And then after that, what do we do with philosophy? And they say, oh, well, if we don't have logic, then we don't have philosophy. Oh, no. What do you mean? Oh no, he never wrote the philosopher. He wrote the sophist, he wrote the statesman, and the third one he promised to write, he never writes. Why? It's because in the sophist, they say, oh look, the path of Parmenides leads us to have no more logic, and without that we have no more philosophy, and then boom! Surprise, surprise, he never ends up writing the philosopher dialogue. He had plenty of time to write it. He lived, uh, I think, over a decade more after that, and wrote plenty of dialogue. He wrote dialogues in, up until the year that he died. So there's no reason why he wouldn't have written The Philosopher, unless he deliberately didn't write it. And scholars think that he deliberately didn't write it. But they think that he didn't write it because they want, he played it, wanted us to find that, to figure it out for ourselves. It's like, oh, but he never bothers to let us figure out many of these other things for ourselves. He just challenges. It's like, oh, you thought you knew that? Well, you don't, you don't really know what you think you know. And, and so it doesn't, I don't know, I'm not convinced that he was trying to get us to figure it out. I think more likely he's trying to make a point in his cons without contradicting himself. Because if, if he starts to write about what a philosopher is, then I think that he's, he's defeated the point that he's trying to make in the sophist, which is a continuation of a point that he was making in his Parmenides. In his Parmenides dialogue, he comes to a similar conclusion about the disappearance of logic, except in the Parmenides dialogue, he refers to it as the destruction of dialectic. And uh, Parmenides dialogue is very interesting because 
if we take everything I've already said into account about Plato and Parmenides, uh, in the Parmenides dialogue is where we get Plato's argument against the theory of ideal forms. And this might be a little surprising to anyone who has grown up learning that Plato is the guy about the forms. He's all, you know, the form of the good and all this stuff. But in the Parmenides dialogue, about a third of the way through, not a, you don't even have to get halfway through, he makes this brilliant argument. It's called the third man argument. There's even a Wikipedia page on it. Third man argument. And it, it refutes the theory of forms. And it's, it's uh, Parmenides who is, who is using this argument. Plato speaking through Parmenides, who's using this argument against Socrates. Socrates is trying to argue for the theory of forms. And eventually Socrates just gives up and he's like, teach me, Parmenides, teach me. Show me the way. And um, Parmenides is like, oh, okay, I will. And then eventually they get back to this point again at the very end, where it's like, um, uh, well, without the forms, then, then what will become a philosophy? And he just leaves it as a question. Parmenides never answers the question. The question gets answered in the sophist, where it's like, oh, well, we need logic for philosophy. Um, well, I guess philosophy, well, something and nothing, they are different. And it's like, that's not the solution. I, don't, I am not convinced that that is how he's trying to answer that question. Especially keeping in mind that he never wrote the philosopher. Yes? Can you restate again, what is it that you said that the sophists at the end, because of the fact that they couldn't reconcile the something, nothing, uh, how that destroyed logic? What is it that they... they okay, because logic, they're thinking... Okay, this is, this, is, this is my sense of it, is that if you don't have a concept of truth and falsity, oh, okay. then you can't really do logic. Because, okay. you know, so it's, logic, a, it's like truth and falsity that, that, mm -hmm. compared, right. and, that but, was connected to this something that... Yeah, because like, the, the thinking, it's, this is a kind of correspondence theory of truth, right? So truth corresponds to something, gotcha. oh, it must, right? And then falsity corresponds to nothing. And th this is the dichotomy that they're trying to get yeah, rid of. Right, and they don't have that kind of logic. And, right. and so... Keeping this interpretation in mind, it's not necessarily the case that Parmenides was arguing for some hardcore monism, or there's only one thing that exists in the world. It could just be that he's trying to say, look, our logic relies on two things, something and nothing, or truth and falsity. And these things, we just they, we can't make sense of them. And so it, we might be able to salvage some sense of truth by getting rid of falsity. And so we end up with one, just one way. So in his poem, he starts off talking about two ways, and one way is the right way, one way is the wrong way. And he even refers to the two ways by two different names. The, the right way, the way of truth, he calls the keluthos. The wrong way, he calls the atarpos. Now, atarpos is like a bypath. I mean, a bypath in Greek. Whereas keluthos is like a real road. And so he's, and he's saying, like, the wrong way, the way where people believe in truth and falsity, that's the atarpos. And the right way is the keluthos. Before he talks about two odoi, two paths, so he, he grouped them together as two paths, but then he gives them two different names. This is this is in the in the poem by Parmenides, not in the not in Plato. And um, the only other time that he uses the word keluthos is cryptically, is in, in a way to say like the people who are on the atarpos think that they're on the keluthos, so they don't realize they're on the wrong path. When when you're on the wrong path, you're not you might not realize it, and. It, it makes sense. It, I can see where he's coming from because Parmenides needs to rely on some imagery of a goddess telling him, you know, enlightening him because a mortal couldn't figure it out for themselves. Because a mortal is just convinced that they're not on the wrong path. But the goddess is saying, oh no, these mortals, they're uncritical, they're helpless, they're confused, and they're, they're divided minds. Well, one mind is truth, one mind falsity, and those two parts just, they don't understand how they, they come together. So, um, the goddess is supposed to enlighten Parmenides and, and pull him off of the way of, of mortal opinion. Where was I going with this? Oh yeah, Plato's Parmenides. So Plato's Parmenides, Plato's Parmenides is uh, it's really more advanced than Zeno's arguments, but this is where Plato comes up with this argument against the theory of ideal forms it's called the third man argument. And it's called the third man argument because Aristotle, Aristotle gave it that name. Aristotle used the same exact argument to argue against the theory of forms. And so we usually think, oh, Plato and Aristotle were butting heads over, th over th this, kind of, this disagreement about universals. Oh, you know, the categories or the forms, right? But it doesn't make sense that they would be disagreeing over that because Aristotle used Plato's exact same argument to refute the theory of forms. So why, why would Plato use that? And then if Plato came up with the defense of the theory of forms, why would Aristotle use Plato's argument? Why not use... Why not come up with a new argument to attack a new, ver the better version of the theory of forms? It's because there was no better version of the theory of forms. He just walked away from it. 
And Aristotle clearly realized that and just used the same argument again, probably to argue people who were like, whether Plato believed in it or not, we believe in it. We, the Platonists, and we, the Neoplatonists, we believe in it. So, screw you, Aristotle. <laughs> We're not going to pay attention to your argument. We're not going to read Plato's Parmenides. So we have that. So it, it's not it's, well, it's not clear that Plato ever really did believe in the theory of forms because he wrote dialogues, and there's never any part where Plato features in his dialogues. It's not like, I believe in the theory of forms. There's no part where he ever says that. It was always a matter of interpretation. What did Plato actually believe? Oh, how much are these the ideas of Socrates versus Plato? Things like that. And I, I'm, my sense is that certain ideological traditions co-opted parts of Plato's dialogues and they found ideas in Plato's dialogues that they liked, such as the theory of forms, and they developed a whole philosophy around that. And we call that Platonism, or Neoplatonism, which is not Plato. But that's, I think that's the part, this is the part where this is a battlefield right now. So, hopefully, uh, I don't know. Hopefully that's giving you something to think about. <laughs> you can go read the Parmenides and go read the Sophists and the, the Statesman, that's another good one. Um, wait, one thing before before I lose it. Um, 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 um. If it ever existed. Hmm? If it ever existed. If it ever Okay, yes, sir. <laughs> so, from what I understand, the effect of all of this is that we can eliminate falsity, but we can probably still salvage the word falsity. So, the word, so uh, from what I get, the, the, the failure that people are making when they're making their statements is instead of saying that that's wrong, instead they're not saying what it is and what we, we think and what it is and what we think it should be to be a true statement. So falsity, just the meaning of it, constricts down to incongruency with some expectation. Well, when does it ever refer to anything? It, if this, I say the clock is red, and the clock, we see the clock, the clock isn't red. Therefore, it is false that the clock is red. Now, that statement right there, like saying it is not something, while like, if the we, clock being red it, it, is, it's, is nothing, It's only right? a property of, it's, 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 we're not saying anything's nothing, we're just saying that you, you, uh, you, uh, there's an incongruency between my statement and the data. Okay, so, so, the data. So something, there's an yeah. incongruency between something and what? An idea. The idea is a thing. Okay, the idea is a thing. Yeah. About? A thing which in this case has no reference. So think about nothing. I mean, it has... <laughs> <laughs> it's the, the idea of it is a reference, because I just created the idea of it right now, the reference in my head. Well, but you can't even imagine... A red clock somewhere. You, you could imagine a red clock, right? I mean, yeah. All right, and so in that sense, you're, you're imagining, oh, it is a clock, right? It yeah. is, and, and it, it is red. And it does not match with my notion of a red clock, therefore it's what I define as a red clock, therefore it's not a red clock. Right, but when you, if you understand the concept of a clock, you're understanding it affirmatively. You're understanding it in yeah. terms of what it is. And the same thing with red. You're understanding it in terms of what it is and not what it's not. And so when you say, oh, well, that clock is not red, well then, you're not ex necessarily understanding what it is. Yeah, exactly. I'm not saying anything about what it is. I'm saying about what it is not. Mm -hmm. And so how do you get to that idea that it is not? Because the, because I have a thing, and the thing has a property with which uh, it does not share. Okay, so it's, it's not red because it's what? It's silver. It's silver. So you're saying that silver is not red? Yes. So what's silver? Silver is silver. That doesn't help. I mean, something is something. So, that's yes, the point. You're saying we have truth. Mm -hmm. So the truth is that it has this quality, and the other truth is that it has that, is that the imaginary clock has the red quality, or if there was a red clock next to it, that clock would have a red quality. It would, and if it if existed, there was right? a If it existed. And if there was a difference between the two, it would just be self-evident. We wouldn't have to make the not statement. Well, this is the this is what people think Plato was trying to do. It's like, oh well, mm -hmm. silver 
and red are different. That's, uh, I was just going to say, <laughs> you're saying you have to have a red clock in mind. So if you compare it to, let's say, a, a random gibberish word, like lover word with color, yeah. right? You wouldn't really be saying anything about what color it isn't because lover word with color doesn't exist. So I think he's trying to say at the end of the day, we talk about nothing. I mean, at that point, we're just having a problem with terms because let's say I imagine some color that is global war. Right. And but what would you I be imagining? I could imagine that. Uh, I, I could imagine some random shade of purple, and then I have could have no, no way you to, to I could have no way to communicate saw, right? it to you. So we could never have the same idea. Therefore, it'd be useless to use it in an argument. I mean, that would be in terms of terms, right? But I think what he was saying, like I'm, I'm actually this is part of my question based on his question. Was, was he arguing more for the fact that, like, aside from other things, when we talk about truth versus false, mm -hmm. he was trying to say, like, we're really just comparing with things when something isn't another something. We don't actually ever refer to an actual nothing. Well, well we can't imagine an actual nothing. We're exactly. There's no, there's no point in referring to a nothing. And that point, all negative statements are in the... What the argument he's making is all, he was saying was in all statements word. in the negative are by nature... <clears throat> Not he's referring to another something, not actual. Yeah. Not yeah. actual and nothing. this is Plato. This is this what people think Plato was so trying to do in the so we're, so, un, so basically, under the 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 mental idea that we're only making positive statements, um, what you would be doing is just to not have to deal with this whole word fuck of never nothing. using the word false. <laughs> we would just de redefine false to As an incongruency between else. two truths. So that, but that's what he was saying, that you can only salvage one. I think that's all Because it. You're, you're, now what you're saying is that you're, you're mixing falsity with truth at this point now. I'm because you're saying, well, it's, it's false to, truth. It's because it's between two truths, you know? So I have two truths in mind. There's one truth that is not the other truth. So it's not. Uh, that's more of a this is the problem. problem. So you don't know what it is. You don't even know that it's true. Well, you just that, know that this truth is not that truth. What makes either any truth? You're calling them truth. I can make up words all day, and then we can easily discover that they don't refer to anything. And I think he's trying to say, hey, actually, falsity is one of those words. We just have never really thought about it. We, we just take it for granted. And so he's like, just like night and day, you know, all the cosmologies start with night and day, and look at all the amazing creatures and mythological figures we can create out of this nonsense, is, I think he's trying to say. Alright, uh, I think you're pressed for time, right? <laughs> I'm down here. I know you have a class to make. Yeah, I have to. I have to get going soon. But there was one thing. Hold on. I just, I just, just lost. Oh, it just crashed. It was, it was nothing. Then how yeah, do, was you know, how do we describe differences in properties then? Well, he's, this is this is the thing. So, okay, that, that just just reminds me. Okay, what's I think that there's a, here's a way to to think about this. Because who cares about the truth? You need to describe the phenomenon of seeing different properties at that point, which creates <coughs> incongruence. Yeah. So it's going to be it's going to be a, the multitude of words, right? That's going to create the problem because we create this universe of terms that just don't fit together. I, mean, I think he's trying to show us that. So here's here's where I'm going with this. The first time we ever hear the word logos, or you know, like logic, in the ancient Greek philosophy is Heraclitus. In the first two fragments of his uh, that we have of him, and he's talking about we need a logos of phusis, which is usually translated as an account of nature or an account of reality. So we need to have some way of, of expressing ideas about it, and so logos. So then we get logos again in the poem of Parmenides. He only uses it once, and the only time he uses it is with the word elenchus, which means refutation. Seems to me that what he's trying to say is that. Heraclitus has created a challenge that we cannot meet. Heraclitus is trying to say that we can describe reality. And Parmenides is trying to say, no, you can't. Logos will not get us to have an understanding of phusis. And he's saying, I'm going to use Logos to refute Logos. And so it could be a very particular challenge made by Heraclitus that Parmenides is responding to. I mean, Logos is a I thought. Logos is a word with many different meanings in Greek. Its most general meaning is probably expression. But Aristotle uses it a lot of times in a way that we would we would say an argument, like a logical argument. They'll say, "Oh, the logos." This Plato uses it like that too, uh, when when with Soc when Socrates is speaking and he uses the word logos, he'll use it is like uh, to make an, it, how we would say argument today. Uh, it also means word. Uh, what else does it mean? It could mean sentence. 
It depends. It, on different contexts, it shows up differently. Heraclitus, it seems to mean a theory of reality. Um, Parmenides, if you think he's responding to Heraclitus, then yeah, it's a theory of reality there too. If not, then maybe he's using it like argument or expression or some but other we way. We use more than one system to define reality. We don't use. We don't only use logic. We use really. Im, 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 I, they're both flawed. The systems, but there's empirical data too. Just the, the, the act of seeing, mm -hmm. or hearing, or smelling. Yeah. So just like experience, like. And but what, what, what I'm trying to get at is we is in order to even like do work that we have today, we need our whole system of our whole system of knowledge that is the most concrete knowledge that people that people think is concrete is based off of the idea of logic verified by empiricism and empiricism verified by logic. So how do we describe you how do we describe differences in properties and differences in definitions while not using the notion of falsity. Okay, why do we even accept that there is difference? But why would there not be difference? I don't know, but that question can go either way, so it seems like we should test them both ways. But the problem is that there seems to be such a heavy assumption that there is. Yeah. And so it, it's the people who believe that there is difference that seem to care the most about proving mm -hmm. that there is difference. People who don't care either way, they're going to explore both paths and might come away feeling totally fine with the idea of, hey, maybe there's no difference. So, I mean, but what's the problem? How would you not contradict yourself just moving around and acknowledging that's a chair and not a desk? Oh, hey, good question. This is where Zeno's paradox is coming. <laughs> <laughs> Zeno was a student of Parmenides. Yeah. Okay, so he had the arrow paradox. The arrow has to fly through the air. Arrow is going... This actually comes from Aristotle. We don't... Uh, but it's related to Zeno's fourth fragment. So we have, oh shit, we have an arrow here. Hey, uh, how did you get there? Huh? How did you get there? How did the arrow get there? How did the pattern in your hand just get there? That's crazy. I know. This, this, is, of this is a perfect example. So in order to leave <laughs> your hand, I'll draw it here. So the marker, we're using a marker now, not an arrow. So the, the, hand, the marker goes from here to here. So we'll call this point, we'll call this point B, and we'll call this point A. I don't know, I'll call this point one and point two. How about that? Point one and point two, it doesn't matter. But in, in order to get from here to here, it had to move from here to here, right? And so the, the moving marker is moving, right? But then, I mean, that seems like a stupid question to ask, but Zeno is gonna say like, why do you think that the moving marker moves? How could it possibly move? And they're like, well, I see it move. Just like the mark, you know, the marker, okay, I see it move. What do you mean you see it move? Okay, if it moved from here to here, it must have gotten halfway. I'm doing a little bit of a dichotomy, I'm mixing this with a dichotomy paradox. Must have gotten halfway, must have gotten halfway, must have gotten halfway. It must have passed through every single point in space along the way on its trajectory. But that means that if it started at this point, it must have passed through the closest point between A and B, the closest point to A that is between A and B. So what would that closest point be? We end up in a problem very similar to asking the question, what is the smallest number greater than one? The smallest real number greater than one. There is no smallest real number greater than one. You can pick any point between A and B, and you'll be able to find, let's pick this point, you'll be able to find another point between it, another point between that. Endlessly, you'll find more and more points. You'll find that the marker, or the arrow in Zeno's case, could never leave point A at all. You're saying, oh, no, 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 no. That doesn't make sense. Okay, so it was here, it was here, it was that here. Okay, so we'll say, let's just, we'll go with that, we'll go with that. So let's say that it was here. So it was, it was here because it passed from here to here, right? So it had to go through this point. So at that point, it was, it was moving or was it at rest? Now the person was like, it was, it was moving. And you're like, what do you mean it was moving? It was moving at that point. Isn't it moving from one point to another? Right? Isn't it moving forward, not moving at one point? You're like, yeah, you're right. If it was moving at one point, it'd be like spinning or something. That's not what we mean when an arrow flies through the air. It's not, it's not like it has to spin at every point that it passes through. That's even more bizarre than saying that it just passes through all these 
endless, en endlessly passes through points. It's even more bizarre. So it's like, okay, so it's not moving at that point, but it has to pass through that point. So when it's at that point, the, the moving arrow is at rest. But if it's at rest, then it's not moving. So the moving arrow is not moving. That's a problem. So this is, uh, this is uh, how he would respond to this. It was like, yeah, you see it, but why do you trust I mean, your senses? Isn't the, endless pat isn't the endless passing through points just a product of vagueness in that we're constantly creating groupings, or rather points, which you can en endlessly dissect those points, but if you just create a defined, set a, an arbitrarily defined size of a point, then that problem goes away. Ah, okay, Zeno talks about that too. In his second fragment, he talks about something that it has, uh, has no magnitude is nothing. And if it has magnitude, it's divisible. So if you say, just arbitrarily say, oh, a point, it's, it's a magnitude of three. Well, you can divide that. Okay, so divide that into, uh, into thirds, and now each part of one point is a magnitude of one. And so we can divide those in half, and they each part of each part of a third of that point would have a magnitude of one half. And uh, so yeah, you can infinitely go to the point, but the, if I put a, somehow the marker is moving through sets of infinity. If you when you talk about it like that, because then you're refuting that it's moving from A to well, yeah, you're refuting that it's moving. From That's a to what B. we're doing. Yeah, we're refuting that. We're saying you see it, but you shouldn't yeah, believe it. <laughs> I'm not saying go uh, become a Parmenidean, you know. Is, but this is this is the story. This is the philosophy. Okay. We think. <laughs> but are you gonna keep going? Cause I don't want to like slow it down more. <laughs> I, I I gotta get going soon. So like okay. yeah, I try to. So, yeah. We'll so try to wrap it up. <laughs> for the for the middle question, the the question where you talked about it being at the middle and not moving. Um, so fair enough, I, mean, I guess I can kind of see how you could say it's not moving because that's not what we mean, it's not spinning or whatever. But could you say that it has potential to move or it's in that current it's, state? This is of, Aristotle's response. He right. tries to answer this. We talk about it in physics now as energy, right? It's got energy, it's going to move if you untoss time. Because that's what you're doing when you look at it in that point, you're like taking a snapshot. So versus when we say rest versus moving, at least now the way I see it, you're not really saying that it has to be moving, but it's in the current state that it will move you let time continue. Could you say that about that midway point? Or? Well, if you let time continue, you see the continuing of time is going to be moving from one point to another. So what we end up having is something like a uh, some, something like a video, right? And so the video seems like continuous motion, but each frame is discontinuous. But okay. when you when you speed it up fast enough, it gives the impression that it's one continuous motion. Okay. What you have is actually different images of things that look very similar. And so what you end up getting in this example is, oh no, there's not a moving arrow at all. We have an endless number of arrows occupying oh. every point along the trajectory. <laughs> but if, if, an, if an arrow is occupying this point, then it can't be occupying the one before and after it. And so one pops into existence as soon as another pops out of existence. We end up... That was Aristotle's argument? No, no, this is Zeno. This is Zeno. Oh. Aristotle was trying to make the argument that uh, he was trying to use the distinction between potentiality and actuality to, to answer this. And he's saying, look, um, a finite space or a finite duration of time is potentially endlessly divisible, but not actually. Oh, yeah. And then he kind of walks away from the problem. I mean, so Zeno just did not understand uh, this. That doesn't seem to solve the problem because it's actually moving, no? And it's um, act it actually has to pass through all those points on the trajectory. So it's it's not like it's potentially passing through them. Because uh, you're saying when I throw it, I'm not potentially throwing it. it is pot I am actually throwing it. Right. right. My, my <laughs> other question was, in Zeno's time, math wasn't able to... <laughs> you see, to it never makes it. It never gets there. <laughs> <laughs> math wasn't able to add infinities, but now we know it can. Are right, certain infinite series? So why? Well, I mean, we just made that up. Why do? Why do we that's even think that's the same that thing as setting an arbitrary number, like putting an infinity in a one? We just made that up. Yeah. You just put infinity in a one. That's basically the same thing I said earlier. Well, no, no, that's not exactly not not putting infinity into one, but saying that you divide them, right? You create these mm -hmm. values that you recognize are smaller than two but more than one. But if you notice that every time you list them, 
just because you know that the list will go to infinity, if you ask yourself, okay, what if I was to take all of them into account, you know you're going to reach two, even though it will take an infinite amount of steps. Oh, no, but this is how, the this is how they try to solve this with the limit, right, in, in right. infinitesimal calculus, but we've, we've talked about this. Okay, so here's the problem, though, is that the, the limit is not the same as the value Actually, of the function. So, um, for example, we have this, there's this, the geometric series, like the basic geometric series is where it's, uh, what is it? It's like one half plus right, right. one. For example, that. Four, yeah. Right? So let's, what was the, what was, what was the general form of it? It was like. It's sigma k equals one to infinity and it's, uh, the k is at the bottom. It's the index. Oh, yeah, yeah, the index. Okay, sigma k, one, two. No, we'll put it to n. We'll put it one to n. Okay. We'll, we'll call okay. this f of n. We'll okay. call this f of n. <coughs> f of n equals six. It's, uh, infinite sum. 2 to the negative k, or you can write it as 1 over 2 to the k. 1 over 2 to the k. Okay, that's what we're going to do. 1 over 2 to the k. Sorry, this is not coming out well. Okay. So, what ends up happening is, as n gets larger, we add more and more sum ends, right? And then, the this is, this is a geometric series, and it converges at a real number value. It converges the limit Right, the limit as n approaches infinity of this is one. Right, this is what you're talking about. Essentially, yeah. So, but here's the problem. There's no value of n that will ever give us the number one. We have to take the limit to get there. The number one is in the codomain of this function. It is not in the range of this function. And we can test this because you will not be able to find a single real number value of n that will give you one. Limit is, is not the same. Limit po posits an infinitesimal. It's that, it's that space that would make up the gap, you know? Because it's like, oh no, ha they have to get to the finish line. It's just that there's this infinitesimal interval that yeah. we can't account for. You assume the interval. Right, so well, physically speaking though, well, physically. Couldn't you say that there is an infinitesimal <laughs> amount of space? Like, I mean, Parmenides' poem space? was called, uh, was called uh, Perifusios, where we get the word physics, so he was speaking physically. I mean, what do you consider to be physical? Well, well, it is that there was an infinite amount of space, though. Like, that <laughs> right. would be infinite. We're getting that esoteric, like and we just use an explanation for this. And that is that the arrows already stopped existing, and A popped out of existence. Every single point along the curve. But we can't have that existence. That's what he's also. That's one of the axioms. It's impossible, right? Nothing cannot exist. The concept of non existence cannot exist. I mean, we can say it exists at every point along the curve. Oh, I mean, yeah, if it exists at all, it would have to exist at every point along the curve, but it also would have to not exist at, at every point along the curve. Okay, yeah, then, <laughs> then, then, then I can't follow you if there's uh, if we can't go with the point the the non-existence. This is the problem: is that Plato Plato is trying to show us like, look, this path leads us to having to get rid of either we have to mix existence and non-existence in a way that just does not make sense, or we have to get rid of non-existence and just deal with existence, but then we can't rely on negation or anything like that, and it leaves us with very, very little left to say. And this is why uh, Plato ends by saying, like, this is the path leads to the disappearance of the Logos. And uh, so what happens to philosophy? Well, his answer to the question is him not writing the third dialogue. He was set to write the, the philosopher. So this, this is the teaching, and this is my interpretation of the teaching. So keep that in mind. My interpretation might not be right. My interpretation is not necessarily endorsed by the scholarly establishment, although it is not unprecedented. It is not a completely original idea. It, and there is literature on this, on, on the theory that I'm, uh, I'm endorsing. Um, and especially the things about Plato, uh, take those with a grain of salt, but go look them up for yourself. Go read the dialogues for yourself and see what, see what you think. Try to read Parmenides' poem and see what your interpretation is. And, um, I don't know, hopefully this was a, hopefully this was enjoyable and insightful, but I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs>